Welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to be discussing the cash flow available for debt service or CFADS, one of the most important metrics in project finance and infrastructure in this lesson. So for all the files and resources, you'll want to go to this URL. I'll paste this below the video and pin the comment there. So you can just click the link below the first pinned comment, cash flow available for debt service CFADS. If you just search for that and BIWS, you should find it, but it's easiest just to click that first comment. So cash flow available for debt service and project finance is defined as EBITDA minus the cash taxes plus or minus the change in working capital minus the maintenance capex. It tells you how much cash flow an asset could potentially use to pay interest on debt and also repay debt principal in the period. And this is important because virtually all deals in project finance use some amount of debt, whether they are acquisitions of existing assets or developments of new assets. In financial models, you use cash flow available for debt service to size and sculpt the debt initially based on the debt service coverage ratio or loan life coverage ratio. So when the acquisition first takes place or after the development and when the refinancing of a construction loan into a permanent loan takes place, it's always based on these ratios and potentially even the construction loan could be indirectly based on these during the operational period. You also use the cash flow available for debt service to calculate the returns to equity investors because you can deduct the debt service from this number to get the cash flow to equity. Now, we get a lot of questions about different types of cash flow, and I haven't covered every single difference here, but I have covered some of the main ones as it relates to financial modeling and calculations. A couple main variations are unlevered free cash flow, cash flow available for debt service, and levered free cash flow. And we've covered unlevered free cash flow and levered free cash flow in separate tutorials. So you can look at those if you want. At a high level, you can start all these calculations with the EBITDA number and you subtract taxes in some way, you factor in the change of working capital and you factor in CapEx. But beyond that, a lot of the specifics differ. For example, with the taxes, with unlevered free cash flow, the company's interest and capital structure don't matter at all. But with cash flow available for debt service and levered free cash flow, you do deduct the net interest expense. And so the capital structure and debt actually matter. CapEx is another difference. With unlevered free cash flow and levered free cash flow, you just tend to deduct all the company's CapEx. You may reduce the growth CapEx and put it at a lower level in later years so that effectively the company's in maintenance mode. But in the earlier years, you will reflect everything there. By contrast, with cash flow available for debt service, you typically only deduct the maintenance CapEx because in project finance, major new growth initiatives are typically funded with specific outside funding, such as additional debt and equity. With the debt service, there's another difference because unlevered free cash flow completely excludes it. Levered free cash flow completely includes it and completely deducts the interest, the debt principal repayments, and may even include new debt issuances. And then cash flow available for debt service is somewhere in the middle. It obviously doesn't deduct the debt service itself, but the taxes in this number are affected by the interest expense, which makes it quite different actually from the way taxes work in unlevered free cash flow. So although these cash flow metrics may appear to be similar, they're actually quite different if you look at the calculations in a bit more detail. So the plan for this tutorial is to go into the basic cash flow available for debt service calculation. Then we'll look at some more advanced features. Then we will look at how you use it in debt sculpting and sizing. We have a whole separate tutorial on this, so I am just gonna give you a quick summary here. And then we'll look at cash flow available for debt service in the equity returns calculations. So at a basic level, EBITDA in project finance is defined as revenue minus the cash operating expenses of the project. Now, normally revenue is based on some type of volume and rate if you're dealing with infrastructure or energy or natural resources. So for energy assets, it could be something like the dollars per kilowatt hour and then the kilowatt hours generated. With cash operating expenses, typically these are linked to either capacity or production. And it could be a mix of both. With something like renewables, so solar and wind, for example, most of these are gonna be capacity related, though there may be some production related expenses as well. When you're dealing with something like a coal or natural gas or nuclear plant, you're gonna see more of a mix. And some expenses will depend on capacity. Others like fuel will depend on the production, the amount of energy or electricity produced. Transportation tends to be a mix where you'll see some capacity-based expenses and some production-based expenses. So if we go in the sample Excel file here, we can see the project capacity. This is quite a big project. It's around 1.6 gigawatts, which is huge for the size of most solar plants. But that's what we have, 1,600 megawatts right here. We have a capacity factor and then a degradation factor. 
And then for the electricity, we have an initial PPA or power purchase agreement rate, an escalation factor, and then we have an operations and maintenance expense. So the way this works is that after the availability reduction and the degradation each year, the asset produces a certain amount of electricity based on the number of hours in the year. They earn a certain rate based on this and the electricity generated times that rate gives us the revenue. With the operating expenses, we have a certain O&M or operating and maintenance expense. This escalates each year based on a fixed percentage and it also depends on the project's capacity. So there's very little here that actually depends on the production, which is pretty standard for solar. You could still see a few things that do, but the majority of the expenses tend to follow the capacity instead. So that's how we get to EBITDA. Now to move to cash flow available for debt service, we subtract the maintenance capex, the change in working capital and cash taxes. The change in working capital is typically a percent of revenue or the change in revenue as is the case here. Maintenance capex is a little bit ad hoc, but it might consist of things like replacing the inverters on solar panels, maybe every five to 10 to 15 years, something in that range. It could also include the decommissioning at the end of the project when the solar panels need to be shut down. Cash taxes here depend on EBITDA minus the depreciation minus the interest expense or the pre-tax income, and we multiply that by the tax rate. So that's the basic idea for how this works. And I just summarized some more of the terms that I just discussed right here. Now, of course, you can make this much more advanced. This is just a very simple example. More advanced features include reserve contributions and withdrawals, which are used to smooth out the cash flows and deal with major expenditures. You could have hedging costs and gains and losses in sectors like oil and gas and mining. These are used to smooth out swings in commodity prices in most cases. You could have decommissioning capex, Mines, solar plants, offshore wind farms, even fossil fuel plants only last for so many decades. And eventually they need to be brought offline and disposed of. So that costs something as well. With revenue and expenses, you could see more categories in full models. For example, you might have cases where some of the revenue is locked in based on an agreed upon rate, but then other revenue actually depends on the market rate. So it can fluctuate a lot more. You could have net operating losses and tax depreciation. So Some assets actually lose money when it's the low season and then turn very profitable when it's the high season and NOLs can help deal with something like that. Depreciation is often accelerated for tax purposes as well. And then scenarios and operational problems could also be modeled because a lot of these assets have unscheduled repairs, maintenance, equipment replacements, all that needs to be factored in to properly evaluate the downside risk. So just to show you an example, I'm taking this from a much more advanced mining model for a lithium mine here. But we have revenue divided into spot revenue and offtake revenue. So a portion of this is locked in and then a portion just depends on market rates. We have many more expense categories here. We have royalties, drilling and blasting, processing, refining, and so on. And then a portion of this is also fixed. So it really is a mix of fixed and variable expenses here. With the cash flow available for debt service specifically, we do start with EBITDA and deduct cash taxes. And we have some of the other items that I mentioned earlier, like the change in working capital and the maintenance capex, for example, but we also have decommissioning capex. We have a lot of reserve contributions here to smooth out the cash flows over time. And we also have hedging costs and hedging gains and losses, which help us when the commodity prices vary and we want to lock in more of a specific price, which could hurt us in some cases, but also help us in others. With this issue of the reserves, I won't go through a full discussion here, but Essentially, it helps out in scenarios like this where the maintenance capex occurs at very irregular times. To prevent the cash flow available for debt service from suddenly dropping like this, we can contribute something to the reserve each year and then withdraw it to pay for these when we know in advance that there's going to have to be some type of equipment replacement a certain number of years into the future. So that's a little bit about the more advanced features. Now, in this context of debt sculpting and sizing, Normally, the idea here is that the allowed debt service in a period equals the cash flow available for debt service divided by the minimum debt service coverage ratio. So if the cash flow available for debt service is 150, the minimum DSCR is 1.5x. That's $100 of debt service. If your initial debt is 800 with a 10% interest rate, that's $80 in interest. And so the sculpted repayment is 100 minus 80 or 20. Now, to actually size this debt in the beginning, you have to use goal seek or the loan life coverage ratio if you can accept circular references or a simple VBA macro to size the initial balance in a flexible way. And in our model here, we actually just use a very simple VBA macro. You can see it on the macros tab. It's nothing complicated. We're essentially just copying and pasting values. And so anytime 
something here changes, we can just go over and click the size sculpt debt button to resize everything. And you can see that with the way the maximum debt service here is defined, we're t linking to the cash flow available debt for debt service output from this macro, and we're basing the max debt service on this. So it factors in directly into all these calculations. And then up here at the top, the initial debt balance is based on the present value of cash flow available for debt service over the debts tenor divided by our targeted loan life coverage ratio. So that's how it works in this type of model. Now, the last thing I want to go through here is the cash flow available for debt service in the equity returns calculations. So the basic components for the equity investors in project finance are the upfront equity used for the development or acquisition of the asset, the cash flows to equity, and sometimes there will be a terminal value as well, but it depends heavily on the asset and the holding period in question. Now, the cash flows to equity are based on the cash flow available for debt service minus the interest expense minus the debt principal repayments. These are normally scheduled repayments based on the debt sculpting, but in more advanced models, you could see a cash flow sweep or even a cash trap or other items that factor into it. The main thing to be careful of here is that there are a bunch of different cash flow metrics, cash flow to equity, cash flow available for debt service, levered free cash flow, unlevered free cash flow, and they're all somewhat different or at least slightly different. So you have to be really careful to keep these straight. So in our simple model right here, the way it works is that we have the upfront equity, what we use to buy this asset in the beginning. So the non-debt portion, and then we have this cash flow post debt service number here, which is really just cash flow to equity. We calculate it by going in and taking the cash flow available for debt service and then deducting the debt interest expense and the sculpted debt amortization. So there is no cash flow sweep here. There's nothing else complicated. It's all very simple and straightforward and all scheduled in advance. And this gets us to our number. And we get to around an 11 or 12% IRR here, which is about what you'd expect on a very stable, low risk solar asset like this. In more advanced models, like the lithium mining model right here, you can see that many more items go into this because we deduct not only the debt service after the CFADS line, but also various types of reserves. We have a revolver, we have a cash flow sweep, we have a cash trap if the asset doesn't comply with certain requirements. So it can get a lot more complicated, but cash flow available for debt service is always the starting point. That's about it. So let's do a quick recap and summary. The basic cash flow available for debt service calculation is EBITDA minus cash taxes, plus or minus the change in working capital, minus maintenance capex. It tells you how much the asset could pay in interest expense on debt and also debt principal repayment. Typically, revenue and expenses in project finance are based on some type of volume and rate figure. And then expenses are based on either capacity or production or a mix of both. More advanced features include items like the reserve contributions and withdrawals, hedging costs and gains and losses, tax items like NOLs and accelerated depreciation, different scenarios, different revenue and expense categories. Cash flow available for debt service is always used in the debt sculpting and sizing that is very common in project finance and infrastructure. And to make it more flexible, you'll often create some type of simple VBA macro that accepts the cash flow available for debt service as an input, copies and pastes it, and then keeps doing that repeatedly until it settles on the proper amount of initial debt to use. Cash flow available for debt service is also used in the equity returns because you deduct the debt service from this to calculate how much goes to the equity investors, and that is a major returns component in most deals. There could be other things as well. There may even be terminal value in some cases, but if you look at most models, the cash flows to equity over a long holding period are the major returns driver for these types of assets. That's about it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this metric and you have some other examples of how to calculate it in both basic and more advanced models.